We have for this edition, we have about 370 participants, over 60 different countries. Uh, so I think um, it has been a great success, uh, this initiative. So thank you very much to, to um, everyone who, um, who participated and then contributing to that. Right, I see everyone seems to be pretty much coming in. So um, as we're having to close at four o'clock sharp in Rome time, um, I, I think I will just leave uh, the, uh, so the floor to Professor Riccaboni for the introduction and uh, to uh, the other partners of the school. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. Thank you to everybody. Here we are opening the fourth edition of the Siena School of Sustainable Development. And uh, thanks to the leadership of uh, Jeffrey Sachs uh, and Enrico Giovannini, uh, current Minister of Infrastructures and Sustainability and Sustainable Mobility, and uh, Carlo Papa, Director of Enel Foundation. Uh, this year, we decided to have a full international school. And I think that the idea of uh, Jeff, Enrico, and Carlo was great because uh, we are having more than 300 participants from 60 different countries and uh, more than one third is from the private sector. So I think that is a uh, really well beyond any, any, any forecast and uh, we are very, very pleased of it. So I would like just to thank uh, as uh, Santa Chiara Leaba of the University of Siena, I would like to thank uh, Enel Foundation for the valuable support and contribution, ASVIS, uh, the Italian Network for, of Universities for Sustainable Development, RUS, UNSDSN, and SDSN Europe for their uh, partnership. This year, the focus is on decarbonization, and in a few moments, we will have the honor and the pleasure to listen to Jeffrey Sachs presenting on the economic and social impacts of decarbonization. I stop here. I thank again everybody for joining us. And I'm very pleased to leave the floor back to Christina. Thank you very much. And um, we should continue with some, uh, some greetings, starting greetings with uh, Dr. Carlo Papa, uh, Director of Renault Foundation, to you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm uh, very excited uh, to be with you, with all of you today and starting this education venture. Uh, today, some of you may recall is uh, Meteorological Day. It's uh, one of the days that remind all of us how important is the path uh, that we are about to start. And I'm very grateful for all of, uh, to all of you for attending this meetings, and specifically to our partner, Professor Riccaboni and Professor Sachs for their dedication uh, to this education venture. So we look forward uh, to work with all of you and interact as much as we can, and clearly look forward to listening to Professor Sachs. Thank you very much, over. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, last but not least, uh, Professor Patrizia Lombardi, who is representing the Sustainable Network for Universities in Italy. Thank you to you for a couple of words. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to attend to the kickoff of this new edition of our summer school. And I say our summer school because it is from the beginning that our network, 81 universities in Italy, aiming to uh, achieve a sustainable development in their campuses, in their communities, um, as uh, uh, joined and supported this, uh, this uh, great uh, learning initiative. So thank you very much to uh, all uh, the partner and thank you, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, for your inspiring uh, all of us. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Petzer Lombardi. Um, unfortunately, my uh, account apart from ASVIS has some technical problems, can't connect at the moment. So I will be just to me to say hello from the ASVIS side. Um, it's a great pleasure, really great pleasure to, to see you all again. And in particular to have um, uh, so many of you now here. We were saying 60 countries, about 370 different participants from all over the world. And it's um, and one thing that we always say sustainable development can't happen without a strong network. And this is what we're trying to create here 
um, with competence, but also with best practices and sharing. And that's what we'll try to do here in this uh, very, very special um, school over the next, um, I guess, four, five months. Huh? Uh, so I look forward to see you, uh, some of you in person and um, in June in Siena and all the others we will meet and uh, get to know each other um, over the next few weeks better. So now I leave to the word to, to Professor Jeffrey Sachs for the introducing lecture of the school. Welcome all. Christina, thank you very much. What a joy to be together with everybody and uh, what an exciting chat stream. Uh, Italy, Bangladesh, Spain, Turkey, Costa Rica, Greece, Portugal, and on and on and on. So it's uh, it's it's really wonderful. Uh, and uh, keep, keep the chat uh, flowing. Um, and thank you to all of the leaders of the Siena uh, International School on Sustainable Development and to Carlo Papa and uh, the NL Foundation for enabling it to happen. I'm, I'm most grateful. We really need a, a global network of knowledge, awareness, expertise, partnership to solve all of the huge challenges in the world today whether it is uh, the pandemic, whether it is war and peace, uh, or whether it is this very vexing and difficult issue of human-induced climate change. Since this is the start of the school, I'm going to give a rather broad overview of the issues of climate and economy. So I want to talk about how we understand this issue and what are the main challenges uh, that uh, confront governments, business, and all of us uh, in society in addressing this issue. So it's going to be uh, rather uh, general, but and rather, I hope, holistic uh, view of the issue of economy and climate, because once you start touching it, this issue is uh, everywhere. It is, of course, on the specific topic of energy system transformation, decarbonization, because that's a, a big part of the uh, way to create climate safety. Uh, but just an hour ago, I was uh, on a call, a meeting uh, with uh, urban specialists talking about a different aspect of climate, adaptation. How do we live? Uh, in a somewhat normal and safe way with the climate change that's already occurring and that is going to intensify. So there are many issues uh, of transformation, adaptation, resilience, finance, sharing of the burdens, developing new technologies. It's a very broad agenda a very difficult agenda, by the way, for politicians, because it is complex, it's interconnected, it's highly technical in many ways. It's about the future, which uh, the politicians are, they like to talk about, but they don't like to necessarily do so much about because they live in the present of power. They don't live in the future and they don't often think uh, enough uh, about the future. It is international in scale, which is also a very hard issue because we're not good at international cooperation. It's intergenerational, uh, which means that the time scale of this problem goes beyond most human problems. Uh, it's taken us a long time to build up this uh, risk that we face, this vulnerability. It's gonna take us uh, quite a long time, decades, to get out of this. And that is hard to uh, be on course for uh, a long period of time consistently to face a global scale challenge. So that's what I want to talk about today, all of those different pieces. I'll share my screen. Oh, I'm not able to share my screen until I'm given permission to share my screen. So I don't know who, who holds the permission. We will, we will do it. Okay. So as soon as I get the screen, I'll show you a, a PowerPoint, which on. I will. Excuse okay. Me. Let me try again now. There we go. Now, like always, 
Where is it? Okay, I think this is it. So uh, I want to give a framework. Uh, and uh, of course, I will share the slides with you uh, afterwards so you can look at them in more detail. My point is holistic approach. In other words, I'd like you to be aware of all of the different ways of understanding this complicated issue of climate and economy. And I have a lot of topics that I want to talk about. Uh, the fact that climate and economy are bicausal. Climate affects economy, economy affects climate. I want to say a word about what economists don't know about this issue. Uh, then about climate policy, about decarbonization pathways, about the energy system in particular, because decarbonization is more than the energy system, about so-called geoengineering approaches, which are global scale approaches other than or complementary to energy system transformation. I wanna talk about land use because land use plays a big part of this story. Most of the challenge is in energy and industry, but a lot is in land use and, the land, and land use affects not just climate, but a vast range of deep human concerns like, is there enough to eat? Is it the food we want? Is the food healthy? Is the uh, agricultural system, both for farming and forestry, compatible with climate safety and with sustainable development? Then I want to talk about the challenge of decarbonization, especially in the developing countries, because the issues are difficult for developing countries. They have two big agendas. One is overcoming poverty, and the other now is decarbonization and climate. And that's a heavy overload. So I want to talk about the interconnections. And then finally, the global diplomacy on this issue. Well, one could spend uh, weeks and weeks, and you will, discussing each of these. So today is just to give you some quick pointers and a quick framework. So starting point is that climate and economy have causation running in both directions. The economy produces greenhouse gases, GHGs. Economic activity actually also changes the surface of the earth. And the surface of the earth, whether it's light or dark, whether it's forested or cleared of forest, changes also the earth's physical properties, including a property called albedo, which is the extent to which solar radiation is reflected back into space, thereby not warming the planet, or to the extent which it is absorbed by earth and then warming the planet. So we change not only uh, climate through greenhouse gases, which are carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and fluorine gases, but also by changing the Earth's physical surface, the albedo. Now, that's one direction, and it's that direction where we're especially studying decarbonization because we want to break the link from economic activity to greenhouse gas emissions, especially the link from energy to CO2. But why we're interested in this is the other direction of causation, and that is running from climate to economy. So why do we care about one degree Celsius warming or what we have as of now, 1.2 degrees Celsius warmer than the pre-industrial temperature. So that's the main thing. Make sure you understand that. The pre-industrial temperature is the Earth's average temperature around the year 1750 before industrialization began. Industrialization pumped greenhouse gases into the economy because industrialization was based on fossil fuel use, burning coal, oil, and natural gas. And that is the 
main source of the carbon dioxide emissions. The warming is 1.2 degrees Celsius since the start of the industrial era. It's actually measured <coughs> technically, usually by looking at the temperature of Earth from around 1880 to 1920, rather than back to 1750. We didn't have many thermometers then. But with arguments by the climate scientists, that, that gives us a pretty good description of the pre-industrial temperature. Now, Earth has warmed by more than one degree. And one of the notable points is that we are now warmer than at any average temperature over the last 10,000 years. By average, I mean decade-long Earth temperature. So we're now warmer than at any time during the last 10,000 years, 1.2 degrees. But it doesn't sound like very much. So what's the big problem? The big problem is that this has many, many impacts. And they're very serious, and they're getting worse. And they include, of course, heat waves. That's most natural. Droughts, floods, rising sea levels, forest fires, and interactions with uh, other phenomena such as tropospheric pollution through ozone. And the results are that these climate change impacts are enormously consequential. And already at 1.2 degrees Celsius, we're experiencing massive damages every year by more extreme hydrometeorological events. In other words, more floods, droughts, heat waves, and the risk of a multi-meter rise of sea levels. Now, for all this reason, the world has agreed through its governments in the context of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, and the Paris Agreement <coughs> under the UNFCCC to try to keep warming to under 1.5 degrees Celsius. But we're already at 1.2 degrees, and the bad news is the warming is now occurring faster than 0.3 degrees Celsius per decade. So there's a very good chance we'll be above the 1.5 degree Celsius limit during the 2030s, if not sooner. Now, there are many kinds of damages, and there are many uncertainties about those damages. We don't know. We haven't been in that kind of climate system before. And the damages have nonlinearities. In other words, it's a big difference to be <clears throat> at minus one degree Celsius and one degree Celsius, because that is a phase transition between ice and water. You get nonlinear transitions and tipping points <clears throat> or amplifications or feedback effects that mean that even small changes in climate that seem small can lead to massive changes in the earth. Rainforests could become open savannas, that is grasslands, or small changes increase of temperature could lead to a multi-meter rise of sea levels. Also, there are huge distributional impacts of these shocks. In other words, people living in different places are hit in different ways. People with different income levels are hit in different ways. And there are huge vulnerabilities for people living in especially dangerous areas, floodplains, low-lying islands, river deltas like Bangladesh. And I know we have some participants from Bangladesh and so forth. So big challenges of unequal impacts within nations, between nations, and across 
generations. So that's the second point. Climate policy involves at least five different topics. And these include mitigation, which mainly means to stop the human-induced change of the climate. The main way of doing that, we think, is by reducing the greenhouse gas emissions to zero or to net negative so that we're taking more greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere than we're putting in and thereby stopping the uh, climate uh, change. But there are other ways of mitigation, including, as I mentioned briefly, geoengineering, which are other solutions that are proposed. Not very good ones, but they are proposed. Then a second category of policy is adaptation and resilience. That means living with climate change. Adaptation generally means restructuring the economy, our cities, for example, our beachfronts, our low-lying areas, our floodplains, our water-stressed environments to adjust to the ongoing climate change. Resilience is a set of policies in order to enable an economy and a society to bounce back faster after a disaster. A third aspect of climate policy is technology policy to develop better technologies so that the economy causes less damage to the climate and to the earth systems more generally. So think of the impacts not only on climate, but on biodiversity, on the functioning of ecosystems, on pollution, on the environment in its broadest sense. And the idea of technology policy is to have our cake and eat it too, as we say, uh, or eat our cake and still have it, meaning that uh, we keep our economy, we keep doing the things we like doing, but we do them with technologies that are not damaging to the environment. But for that, we need to promote, to discover, to develop, to innovate, to demonstrate, and to diffuse those new technologies. Climate policy also includes global governance. If we changed only our own climate, suppose that our own emissions only changed the air in our own homes, or our economy only changed our own city's climate, or what happens within a nation stays within a nation. Well, we would have solved this problem a long time ago because we would say, look, we're doing it to ourselves. We better get this under control. But the problem, of course, is that when you or I emit carbon dioxide because we've ridden in a car or flown in an airplane and our activity has contributed to global warming, that carbon dioxide doesn't affect just us, but affects everybody in the world. Because as the earth scientists say, the atmosphere uniformly mixes the greenhouse gases in a period of 30 days. The carbon dioxide spreads out around the world, irrespective of where it originated. And so we have a tragedy of the commons, as economists say, or a global public goods crisis in that we need global cooperation to get the greenhouse gases under control. And a fifth area of policy is climate justice. Because if we're at 1.2 degrees Celsius, how did we get there? Well, uh, mainly because the United States and Europe, and now increasingly China and Russia, burned coal, oil, and gas, and therefore changed the climate. But what about people living in Africa or Latin America or Central Asia? They didn't do it. It's not their responsibility, but they're bearing the costs. Is that just? 
do the rich countries have a historical responsibility to the poor countries? I think most of us think so, but if you are a president or politician of a rich country, you say, no way, we have no responsibility. That's the US position, for example. Don't talk about historical responsibility. Even within countries, the impacts are highly unjust. And in the United States, minorities, people of color, live in more dangerous environments, more vulnerable to pollution, to flooding, uh, to other kinds of hazards than richer people. It stands to reason because uh, richer people in general have two advantages. They have the money to buy property in safer places, and they have the power of politics to say that uh, polluting uh, industries and factories should be put in places away from them. And so there's a lot of climate injustice as well. I mention all of this because when we think of climate policy, it's a package deal. Uh, maybe the US and Europe like to talk about what developing countries should do to mitigate because then it's affecting the rich people. But the uh, rich countries don't so much like to talk about climate justice. They say, what, me? I, I didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, and so uh, we have a la carte climate policy, which is uh, what the politicians find convenient, not what the holistic needs are. So when we start to get granular, and as you study this issue, you'll wanna look at what to do. And my favorite word in this is pathway. We are in 2022, March 23rd, and we know that within uh, 27 years by mid-century, we absolutely need to be at net zero greenhouse emissions. And remember the greenhouse emissions are not only carbon dioxide from fossil fuels, but carbon dioxide from other sources like chopping down trees or from various manufacturing processes such as making cement that are transformations of minerals, not energy use per se, but also from other greenhouse gases. Methane, which is uh, also caused by many economic activities from farming to uh, transmission of, of methane to gas-fired uh, power stations, and also nitrous oxide, which is uh, produced also in a number of ways, uh, including uh, the use of nitrogen-based fertilizers, uh, urea-based fertilizers, which when used and not taken up by plants, have chemical reactions that in part release nitrous oxide into the atmosphere, thereby contributing to warming. So when I say decarbonization pathway, I'm really speaking about the whole range of greenhouse gas emissions. And there are at least three big buckets, three big categories to consider. One is the energy related. That's mainly fossil fuel use, burning coal, oil, and gas. Then there are industrial, mainly chemical processes where calcium carbonate uh, is uh, a base product for producing cement. Uh, and when it's turned into calcium oxide, it releases CO2 in the manufacturing process of cement. And in metallurgy and in petrochemicals, chemical reactions to use underlying uh, molecular uh, resources for our building materials, for example, release CO2 in their preparation. Then there are the land use related. So when we think about decarbonization, we need to think about, again, a holistic account of how we map economic activity into greenhouse emissions. 
a lot of attention, and I think uh, rightly so, is focused on the energy system. Because the energy system, meaning both the primary energy use and its transformation in power plants and its transformation in vehicles and in buildings and in industry, accounts for a lot. Let's say uh, maybe 55 to 60% of total greenhouse gases, maybe even more. Uh, depending on how you allocate uh, different uh, um, categories. But the energy system's a big deal in this story. And we should understand that it all comes from fossil fuel use. And fossil fuels, meaning coal, oil, and methane or natural gas, have been the key to economic development for two centuries. Without fossil fuels, no modern economy during the last two centuries. It was actually the development of the steam engine starting from uh, around 1696 and 1712 and the first two models and then to James Watt steam engine in 1776 that said, we can use coal to industrialize that changed the world economy. So we grew up, all of us, in a fossil fuel-based world economy, and now we have to get out of it because we are using so much fossil fuel that we are emitting between 35 and 40 billion tons of CO2 per year as a result of our fossil fuel use. So we need to transform the energy system. How? Well, a lot of work has been done, and the good news is it's feasible it's actually even affordable at not such a different cost from what we would pay for continuing a fossil fuel economy. What is the basic idea? The basic idea is that we produce electricity in the future with zero carbon power, mainly wind, solar, hydro, nuclear, or fossil fuels combined with carbon capture and storage. So zero carbon electricity plus electrification of just about everything that can be electrified reasonably, including our cars and our heating and our cooking and a lot of industrial processes too. And then for the parts that can't be electrified, other zero carbon fuels. So instead of putting petroleum into the truck, you put hydrogen into the truck. Or instead of diesel fuel, you put hydrogen. Or instead of aviation fuel, you put biofuel. But the idea is that for the things that can't be electrified, and that's thought mainly to be ocean transport for long distances, perhaps heavy trucking, many industrial processes, <coughs> and um, aviation that will need zero carbon fuels to do it. So that's the combination. Zero carbon power, by which I mean electricity, electrification, and zero carbon fuels. Each of those is a vast area of research and development. What we know now pretty well is that that combination, zero carbon power, mass electrification, and zero carbon fuels is a feasible pathway to net zero carbon dioxide emissions by mid-century for the world if we focused all of our efforts on achieving this. And this is the big challenge, getting that focus from an economic point of view, there's one basic point to emphasize, and that is that it's not so expensive, but it requires a lot of upfront financing. When you decide between a solar field to produce electricity and a coal-fired power plant, the coal-fired power plant, watt for watt, is cheaper at the beginning, lower capital costs, much lower, but then you have to buy fuel 
each year. Whereas when you invest in solar power, the capital costs are upfront. They're much higher. But then you don't invest in fuel all the time. The fuel comes from the sky for free. And so in order to make this zero carbon power transition, we need plenty of capital for upfront investments. It has to be at low enough interest rates to make it feasible to make the shift from low capital cost, dirty fossil fuels to high capital cost renewables. This is more or less already where we are in the rich countries and we use the term grid parity to say that it's already pretty much at about the same cost or even lower to make a wind farm or a solar farm compared with a coal-fired power plant. But in poor countries, the coal-fired power plant is still much easier to do because poor countries don't have access to low-cost capital. If they did, they would be decarbonizing much more easily. Well, I've got a lot of other things on this screen around the energy transition. One is that we need to face up to the challenges of the difficult sectors, heavy trucking, aviation, ocean shipping, steel making, petrochemicals. These are the sectors that don't have an obvious, easy zero carbon answer, but they do have zero carbon answers but they need more RD, D, and D. That means research, development, demonstration, and diffusion. A third point is that the digital economy, e-commerce, e-services, and e-management of infrastructure goes together with decarbonization quite well. So digitizing and decarbonizing really is a good package deal. It's true, digital also uses power, but it saves a lot of energy as well by a more efficient design of society. So digitalization and decarbonization go together. We face big challenges, economic uh, and geopolitical, in creating the new industrial supply chains for the zero carbon power, because now you need batteries, for example. Batteries, as they're made now at least, use cobalt. 70% of cobalt comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. That should be good for DRC. I'm hoping that it will be. But it also means that since China now controls a lot of that cobalt, that there's real issue of how we're going to ensure a non-conflictual pathway in which Europe, the United States, India, uh, China and others say, yeah, we feel secure from, a, from an industrial, I mean, from a national security point of view in making the transformation. So finally are the questions, what kind of policies can induce the transformation? Should you just announce you're not allowed to build a new coal fire power plant? Count me in that camp. That's what I think we should do. Governments that make clear regulatory standards. Or maybe the government says, we'll produce in a state-owned enterprise the clean energy. That's a public investment approach. Or maybe the government says, we won't directly produce, but we'll fund the R&D. That's a science-based promotion approach or industrial policy. Or the government says, we will use federal lands no longer for oil and gas production, but for wind and solar. So that would be a land use strategy and so forth. There are many policies that go into an energy system transformation. Economists love one of them, a carbon tax or a tradable permit system like in the Europe's uh, emissions trading system. But I tend to regard that as just one part of the technical fix in a much more sophisticated and multi-dimensional policy framework. Let me mention geoengineering is a different approach. It says, we're gonna continue with the fossil fuel use, but we're going to offset it. Uh, one way 
sounds crazy. To my mind, it is crazy, but some serious scientists support it, is to dim the solar radiation by actually putting aerosols into the, uh, the, the stratosphere. Sounds frightening to me. I don't want to see it happen. Uh, another way is actually to set up giant mirrors in space to deflect some of the solar <coughs> incoming radiation. Another way is mass capture of carbon dioxide from the air through kind of giant scrubbing systems and putting that carbon dioxide under the ground. This is called carbon dioxide removal. I have uh, colleagues at Columbia University that work on that. It's not crazy, but it's very expensive and it uh, may get cheaper in price but I doubt that it can offset the 35 to 40 billion tons of CO2 per year emitted by fossil fuel and growing. So it could be complementary to other kinds of decarbonization. Let me mention that land use in general, if I can include agriculture and land management, accounts for perhaps one third of overall greenhouse gas emissions. One way to think about that is all the trees being chopped down. Deforestation is a major force of releasing carbon dioxide from vegetation into the atmosphere. So deforestation or degradation of, uh, of vegetative cover releases CO2, and that's maybe 10 to 15% of total CO2 emissions. But then there is also methane and nitrous oxide associated with land use with the ruminant farm animals like cows that emit a lot of natural gas from both ends of the cow, by the way, uh, and uh, need, we need an answer to that. One of the potential answers to that is some change of diet, less beef eating, just as an example of how many ramifications there are to get the full scale climate safety system. Now, let me quickly turn to the issues of decarbonization and development. Poor countries are poor. They want to escape from poverty, but all of what I'm speaking about requires finance. It requires technology. And there are huge issues of how to combine economic progress with the high capital costs of decarbonization and with the fact that technology resides with the few advanced countries, not primarily with the low income and lower middle income countries. So a number of issues are hot on the table. Uh, and uh, this includes development finance, technology access, and the needs of special geographies such as small island developing states or low-lying delta countries like Bangladesh, which are going to experience specially hard effects from climate changes that those countries did not cause and can't afford to offset under their own resources. So the development agenda is deeply interconnected with the decarbonization agenda, but the rich countries don't like to share with the poor countries. So it is an agenda that is absolutely fraught with geopolitical conflict and stalemate. The rich countries have the money and they have the power. The poor countries have the people and they have the needs. And we have not solved those problems yet. Finally, all of this comes in a category that economists call global public goods where market forces per se will not direct resources in an efficient manner. And the purpose of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Climate Agreement is to get public policies aligned across national borders. But there are big limits of the processes as they work today. There's free riding, meaning one government says, well, that's all fine. This is very serious, but you do it first. There is a lack of fair burden sharing. There is a rejection by the rich countries of historical responsibilities. 
There is a lack of enforcement mechanisms in international agreements. There is too little sharing of best practices. There is privately owned intellectual property so that even when we know what to do, it's too expensive to do it because it's held by a patent holding company which charges high prices for its products. And there are massive geopolitical tensions, even war now, which makes it very hard to get the global cooperation. So some of the issues that I expect that the Siena International School will be talking about in the next few weeks, let me just mention them quickly, how to handle historical responsibilities, how to mobilize development finance, how to address losses and damages. That means when disasters hit, who bears the costs? How can there be fair sharing? How to introduce enforcement mechanisms into international agreements, like Europe's proposal for a border tax on imported CO2 emissions, what's called a cross-border adjustment mechanism. How to spur research and development, technology transfer, and proper management of intellectual property, such as open source science. How to ensure that global supply chains, whether it's for cobalt or for palm oil or for soybeans or for coffee, are sustainable. How to integrate the climate agenda and the sustainable development goals agenda. And how to incorporate industrial policies in Europe in the United States, in China, in India, and elsewhere, into an international trading system that doesn't just leave us with competing blocks. How to view Europe's, I think, very wonderful and innovative European Green Deal into this broader international system. So I'm... Uh, I'm going to do the easy thing and say, well, that's good homework for all of you. Uh, these are hard questions. They remain, unfortunately, largely unsolved, both in theory and in practice. And that's why we are in a dramatic time. We need to change the way the world's systems operate, the way the world's economies operate. We need to do it quickly. We need to do it cooperatively. And it is an unprecedented challenge. So thank you very much. All best wishes. And I can't wait to be in Siena together with you in person in June. And uh, back to you, Angelo. Thank you, Jasper. Uh, thank you. Please, yep. please, Simone. Well, thank, you. Simone. Thank, you for, thank you, Professor Sachs, for, for this uh, inspiring lesson and framework on decarbonization. Um, uh, if, if you agree, we can, we can have a couple of questions uh, from the Q&A session. Uh, Fantastic. Good. Yeah, okay. if they're quick, because uh, I, I have to end at the top of the hour, I think you do as well. Okay, of course, of course. I, I take the first one uh, is how do we educate economically for following the pathways for curtailing GIG effects or alternatives for bringing actions? So how do we educate economically? I think the best way is uh, to envision or to create scenarios to see what our real options are. We can do that in formal uh, optimization models. We can do that uh, conceptually. We can even write uh, or read uh, science fiction books like uh, The Ministry of the Future, uh, which was a very good book last year about climate politics. But one of the best of these is the report on net zero by 2050 written by the International Energy Agency. And it's something that I think uh, students should look at. It was written by the research team at the International Energy Agency, uh, led by a good friend of ours, uh, Laura Cozy, uh, who's a specialist uh, in energy. And that study shows how this can be done in very practical terms. So my experience with politicians is that they like to be practical. They need you need to be practical with them. <laughs> don't give them a theorem. They don't want a theorem. <laughs> if they wanted a theorem, they'd be a professor maybe. But they're politicians, so they want to know what do you want me to do. And for that, I think we need to work out scenarios. 
Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. The second and the last one, how do we ensure that the carbonization in developed countries don't increase the carbon footprint in developing countries? So uh, this is a, an excellent question, which is that it can happen. It has happened actually in the last 15 years that as the rich country said, you can't make uh, certain products uh, anymore in our country because they emit. What happened was a lot of the production was shifted to China, to uh, East Asia, to Vietnam, and to other places where they're very polluting coal-based production. And that leakage uh, is recognized now by Europe in saying, well, our industries don't want to compete on the rebound, the boomerang effect with the low cost producers in Asia that are producing in a very polluted way. So we'll put on a border adjustment so that you, it won't be feasible to re-import the dirty products. I like that solution up to a point because it's got to be combined with financing for the poor countries. Otherwise, it's just going to absolutely be a barrier to development. So we have to solve the financing issue alongside the enforcement issue. They go hand in hand. And I live in a country that, where the politics are incredibly selfish. Uh, of course, we had a president, a, a nut, uh, who uh, kept talking about America first as a policy. So he championed selfishness. And he's a very selfish man himself, uh, really pathologically. But we don't yet have this awareness that the whole world needs the solutions together. And I put a lot of weight on the financing challenge because as I've said, the change is very capital intensive. So if poor countries are told you do it, but there's no capital there, they can't do it. And then if they're told you can't sell to us anymore also, then we're not providing a solution. We're worsening the international inequality. And we need to have that holistic approach. The approach must be sustainable development, which means economic progress, social justice, and environmental sustainability. Fantastic. Thank you very much again, Professor Sachs. We, we are perfectly in time with, uh, with the timeline of, of this lesson. Thank you very much again and looking forward to see you personally here in Siena for the third phase of this uh, Siena International School on Sustainable Development. Wonderful. Bravo. Much. Best wishes to all the students and see you, uh, see you in person soon. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank, thanks to you. Uh, I keep uh, some more minutes for, with, uh, with the participants uh, uh, to the school to give some information about next lesson will be next Friday uh, with Professor Antonio Navarra, full professor of uh, the University of Bologna, uh, with the title of the lesson is The Challenge of Climate Science. Um, will be uh, a, 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 in, an information with the link of uh, for for uh, connecting the webinar will be circulated uh, in, in the in the coming hours or tomorrow. And um, I leave the floor to uh, Professor uh, Riccaboni for uh, the last words uh, of the lesson of today. Thank you, Simone. I think that uh, we are very pleased of the, of the very exciting and uh, illuminating presentation by Jeffrey Sachs. I think that uh, we couldn't have a better start. And as he said, he gave everybody a great homework and uh, we will uh, take care of his suggestions and we will uh, work on it during the next uh, appointments in this, uh, in this school. So I think that uh, uh, we are very pleased that uh, everything worked very well and uh, we look forward to seeing you next Friday for the second class. I don't know if uh, other partners of the initiatives uh, would like to add something and a foundation or ASVIS. Uh, again, thanks a lot to ASVIS and to the Foundation for the partnership. We are working together on this uh, subject and we are very pleased that uh, 
uh, we have uh, more than 300 people from uh, 60, 60 countries. I was uh, reading the, 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 the chat as you were doing, and I see that uh, uh, many of the, of the messages were asking for creating networks. So I think that this is, uh, this is already an interesting outcome of, of the first class, and maybe uh, with Simone and the partners, we will uh, think in the next uh, few days how to uh, make it sure that we create a network with the social uh, networks and social media. So we will uh, return to you on this because I see that many of you are asking for that. So thanks a lot and uh, back to you, Simone. Uh, thank you very much again. Uh, just to give an answer, a quick answer to some of the question in the chat, uh, if uh, the lessons will be recorded. Yes, they will be recorded and we are organizing uh, uh, um, a, a portal and um, a website through SDG Academy, which is the education channel of uh, the UNSDSN, to gather all the recordings uh, and the video of the lessons and to give them uh, available to everyone. So the, the, the answer is yes, you, you will uh, receive more information on that, uh, especially on the timing of this uh, uh, gathering of uh, uh, re records. Thank you very much again. Uh, I, if Christina wants to... Uh... No, I think we're all set. Thank you, everyone. Okay, you. see you on next Friday. Bye-bye. Thank see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.